What do you think would happen if a species evolved a powerful, undeniable craving for an incredibly nutritious and seasonally available food, and then a company figured out how to duplicate that food, make something that tasted extremely similar, only turned out to be extremely toxic for that species? What I'm saying is, is that there'd now be a toxic substance and that species would want it all the time. Let's talk about sugar. Sugar is in everything. I mean everything. Like when I first started really looking into sugar, I was shocked to find how many things it was in. In fact, I gave up sugar for a while on a little challenge. I thought, I'll take a break from sugar. I came home one day, I made myself some lunch. I was ready. The lunch was sitting there. The lunch was some pasta with some tomato sauce, all healthy, organic, good stuff. And then I took a mouthful of it and I almost spat it straight out because it just tasted wrong. I thought maybe the tomato sauce had gone off. So I picked up the jar. I looked at the date to say, hey, is this, you know, maybe it was out of date or something. No, perfectly in date. I smelled it, smelled okay, tasted a little bit, tasted okay, but something wasn't right. Something wasn't right. It was really sweet, like really sweet. And so I started looking at the ingredients. And here's what I found that shocked me. I mean, truly shocked me. Sugar was the number two ingredient in a beautiful organic tomato sauce. Let me ask you, if you were making some tomato sauce at home, you know, for your pasta or for a lasagna or a pizza or something like that, would you take some tomatoes and chop them up, a little garlic, some onion maybe, oh, some basil and oregano, and then two tablespoons of sugar? No, you wouldn't. But are you curious at all as to why a food manufacturer might do that? They do it because sugar has some really important roles in the body. One of them is, is that sugar triggers hunger. This is an evolutionary protection of our species. You see, our species has spent a long, long time doing everything it could to avoid starvation. Starvation has been the number one cause of death of our species right up until the modern times. And so what that means is, is that when fruit suddenly came out onto the trees and was available to us, the idea was if we ate a little, our body would be triggered to keep eating even if our stomach got full because who knew how long it would be there for and also what season's coming next. Winter, probably an entire problem around getting food. And so if we didn't eat enough now, we might not survive the winter. So sugar triggers in us appetite. And so sugar manufacturers put it in everything. Out of the something like 60,000 different foods that are available, packaged foods that are available in our shopping mechanism today, something like 70% of them have some form of sugar, corn syrup, or other refined sweetener. And we are getting addicted. In fact, it's even worse than that because from a marketing perspective, the sugar manufacturers and the food manufacturers that are using sugar in this way, they know what they're doing and they know we're catching on. And so what are they doing? Ever better advertising. All the time with the manipulation almost to the level of hypnosis to get us to feel good about their products. One of my favorite examples, it was a viral video that some friends of mine sent to me. You know, you don't watch every viral video that gets sent to you these days, but when it arrives the third or fourth time, you gotta tune in. And this video starts off and it's gorgeous. What happened is somebody went out and purchased all kinds of CCTV footage from bank machines and street cameras and store cameras, all kinds of, and they licensed it and created this one long video of people doing the most incredible things. I'm talking about the bank machine camera that caught the person who dropped their wallet and a person came up right behind them and handed them their wallet. And then the little old lady who's trying to cross the street in the snowstorm and none of the cars will stop. And then all of a sudden these two young men come along and they stop the traffic and take her across the street. And it's story after story after story that just fills you with joy and love. And these days, let's be clear, you know, watching the media, watching the news is generally more scary than wonderful, right? But this video is the opposite. It just, it just brings back one's hope in humanity. And at the peak of your positive feelings, Coca-Cola. No kidding. What are they doing? Well, in psychological terms, they're doing something very similar to the Pavlovian dog experiment. What they're doing is getting you to link an emotional experience with a physical stimuli. In other words, they're trying to make you feel good about their product before you even buy it, before you even drink it. How about the cereal manufacturers? Here's what's really scary. The cereal manufacturers will pay grocery stores to keep their sugar-laden, plastic toy-filled cereals at 
child height view. Why? Because in marketing, there's a term, a technical term, it's called pester power. And the marketing companies know that there's a price that parents are willing to pay to end pestering. And so they put the sugar laden, brightly colored plastic toy giveaway cereals right at the height that your children can see it. And so the pester power begins. But let me ask you something really careful here. What do you think the number two ingredient is on just about every breakfast cereal? Sugar refined sugar it's right there on the label and and it doesn't matter that in bold print on the front it says fortified with this vitamin fortified with these essential nutrients yeah but the number two ingredient is sugar kellogg's frosted flakes what's the number two ingredient it's not sugar because the number one ingredient is sugar we are living in a time when our entire western world is facing a massive healthcare crisis and at the root of that crisis is refined sugar. Just in case you're starting to think that I'm, you know, I'm feeling a bit like a conspiracy theorist to you, here's what came out in late 2016. The sugar industry in the 1960s realized that studies were coming out that demonstrated that sugar was related to heart disease. Now this would clearly be bad for business. And so they got their lobbyist. I'm not talking about their marketing department. I'm not talking about their sales department. Their lobbyist. In other words, the people designed, the people charted with the responsibility of influencing the educators and legislators to increase the demand for their product, right? So they went to their lobbyists and this is what their lobbyists did. They hired two Harvard researchers and they paid them to conduct a study that would connect fat with heart disease instead of sugar. These scientists were paid in today's terms about $50,000 to do this study. That study was then picked up and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. That basically made it lore. It just made it industry knowledge that the problem was fat, not sugar. $50,000, $50,000 is what they paid. And millions and millions and arguably billions is what they made. In fact, if you consider this scary statistic, that in the 1970s, there was almost nobody under the age of 40 that had type two diabetes. In fact, back then, it was called adult onset diabetes because young people didn't get it. Today, in the United States, there are something like 20 million young people with type two diabetes or in pre-diabetic condition. That is a massive change due in no small part to $50,000 to two Harvard researchers. Let's be clear, you couldn't do that today. The New England Journal of Medicine is very clear. Now, you have to disclose your funders before you can publish your study. But things were different back then. And so let's talk. Let's talk about this because right now we're in a situation where if you decided you wanted to reduce your sugar intake, it would be very difficult because it's everywhere. It's in everything and it's also been conditioned into us. I mean, there are certain things that are just part of life, right? I mean, what could be more American than apple pie? Except for the fact that apples come from Kazakhstan. You see, the marketing of these things has been designed to link things to seasons. Of course, you have to have candy at Halloween. You gotta have a candy cane at Christmas. You gotta have chocolate at Easter. Really? Do you? Because if you gotta have that stuff, pretty soon you might need to have insulin control. So what I wanna challenge you to do is spend seven days with me. Seven days to go on a little no sugar challenge. It doesn't mean being done with sugar for the rest of your life, but what it does mean potentially is increasing your consciousness about the way sugar enters your life. How about that? Because right now what's happening for most people, and by most people, here's an interesting statistic. 154 pounds, do you know how heavy that is? 154 pounds is a person. The average American, and I'm only using Americans in this case because we have the statistic, I'm going to suggest to you that it's exactly the same in Fiji, in Canada, in the United Kingdom. It's the same in most of the Western world. But the statistic in the United States is the average American is eating 154 pounds or over 70 kilograms of sugar. Isn't that interesting? And one more thing I want you to know. Remember we talked about the evolutionary design to protect you from starvation? You see, the other thing that sugar communicates to the body, the sugar communicates to the body and says, hey, if fruit is in season, if fruit is on the trees, then the next season that's coming is winter. And if winter is coming next, what we had better do is find powerful ways of storing water and nutrition in our bodies. And so sugar stimulates us to store fat. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is consider taking a seven day sugar holiday with me 
so that at the end of that seven days if you decide to have sugar you can do it completely consciously with knowledge knowing that you're doing it in a mindful way or maybe you want to give it up entirely so join me to create consciousness around sugar a seven day opportunity to change your relationship with sugar right now Welcome to day one of a new relationship with sugar. I really believe that the huge healthcare crises that we see all around the Western world right now are really not so much a healthcare crisis, but they're really more of a food industry crisis and a self-care crisis. And at the root of it is sugar. So over the next seven days, we're going to go through a carefully constructed process to help you increase your awareness, consciousness and mindfulness about the decisions you make relative to sugar and how sugar makes you feel. This is very, very fun and really powerful. Over the last 20 years, I've been studying nutritional anthropology and behavioral change psychology. And over the last five years, we've been helping thousands and thousands of people in over 20 countries around the world completely change their food behaviors and their food habits. So now you're going to get a chance over the next seven days to change your relationship with sugar. And it's important for you to know this is not about taking away any freedom from you. In fact, what it really is, is about giving you back your freedom. I once had a client come to me and he said, I'm thinking about doing one of your programs, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid because I really value freedom and I feel like you're going to give me all these rules and take away my freedom. And I said, I see. Let me ask you something. What is it that you see that you feel so free to eat? What is it that you feel so free about? And he goes, well, I feel free to have dessert whenever I want. I feel free that if I want to have cookies, I feel free that if I'm at a conference and there are you know, donuts or bagels, I can just have them. And I feel like you're going to take that away from me. And I said, okay, but here's my new question for you. Can you not eat those things? Of course, he wasn't really sure what I meant. So I said it again. I said, listen, imagine that you're not very hungry, but somebody puts one of those foods down in front of you. Can you not eat it? And he said, well, no, no, I mean, I can't. Even when I try and go on a diet or something, I can't not eat it. And I said, so where's your freedom then? You see, we live in an age, we live in a time, we live in a, in a world right now where people's freedom around food has been removed. It's been removed in a number of ways, one of which is that we are given the ingredients. You see what's really fascinating? Humans, supposed to be the most intelligent species on the planet, suffer with more painful disease than any other species on earth followed closely of course by our pets and livestock and zoo animals because they are the other animals living in captivity animals living in the wild paying attention to their natural instincts in the natural environment suffer far less disease and so here we are we're going to make a change right now from sugar are you ready so today what i want you to do is i want you to give up absolutely nothing i don't want you to give up a thing in fact what I want you to do today is give yourself a little extra permission. I want you today to recognize that it is okay to eat what you want. If you've been resisting it, go ahead and have it. The only things that I want you to add to that freedom are awareness. And it works like this. Step one, I want you to read the ingredients of everything you eat. I'm talking about everything because I think that you may end up being a little bit surprised at how prolific sugar and corn syrup and the other 60 some odd names that sugar comes under is hidden in everything. I think you're gonna be surprised at how, how prolific it is. And so I'm gonna ask you that while I'm not suggesting you change a thing, in fact, if you change anything, it's to allow more stuff in that you may have been trying to take a break from, you may have been trying to use willpower to save yourself from, no. Today's the day where if you have a little conversation going on in your head that goes like this, Oh, I really feel like having that cookie. No, I mean, really, we need to go on a diet. You've seen the situation here. We got to change some things. Yeah, but just this once. I mean, look, after all, we worked so hard today. No, I really don't think we should do it. Yeah, but Eric said we could. Right there, you're going to go ahead and have it. You're going to go ahead and have it and read the ingredients. And notice where sugar, corn syrup, fructose, glucose, and all the other sugars are. Where on the ingredients list are they? And you're gonna notice something else. How does it make you feel? How does it make you feel? First of all, does it taste as good as you thought it was going to be? Does it really? Maybe it does. But then, right after you've eaten it, I wanna know how you feel. And then, half an hour later, I wanna know again 
how you feel. Do you notice that sometimes when you eat things that are rich in sugar, that initially you get a little jolt of energy? Yeah, it's like your body's like, wow, look at all this extra stuff I can burn. But then, but then half an hour later, isn't it true that sometimes we have like a little sugar crash where all of a sudden there's a little bit of energetic food coma going on? That's the next thing we're gonna pay attention to. And we're gonna do it through something called the food timeline. The food timeline allows people to really increase their mindfulness about their decisions and the impact of eating food. It works like this. There's an emotion that you have before you decide to eat something, particularly something non-functional, particularly something full of sugar. So there's this emotional state, right? You're experiencing emotional state, and it's usually a low emotion, a low frequency thought. It's things like, I'm feeling a little lonely right now, or I'm feeling a little bored, or a little sad, or a little depressed. And if I'm feeling that way right now, if I were to eat that chocolate, donut, cookie, cake, ice cream, then maybe I would feel better. So, we start off by looking at what that emotion is. What is that emotion? What is it for you? As it comes up today, I want you to really pay attention. The emotion you're having at the same moment you're thinking that you should eat the food. Once you know what that emotion is, you've identified one of your trigger emotions. This is very powerful because now you know that trigger emotion, you know to watch out for it in the future. Then, once you've figured out the trigger emotion, the next step is to take a look and say, okay, what emotion do you think you will have if you eat the food, right? So let's say somebody is feeling a little, you know, a little sad and depressed over here, and they think that eating that food is gonna make them feel better. But what does better mean? Well, what it means maybe is happy, or loved, or connected, or something like that. Oh, and by the way, why might we feel that way? Well, maybe when you were six, you were running along, you fell over, you skinned your knee, it hurt, you cried, your mother came, and she hugged you, and she kissed you, and she gave you a cookie. And from that moment on, that sweet thing was linked up to feeling better and love. I'm not saying that's what happened to you. What I'm saying is something like that probably did. And so now we have a belief that certain foods are gonna give us a certain emotion. What you're gonna do this week is pay attention to that. You're gonna say, here is how I feel before I eat it. And here's what I'm hoping I will feel after I do. Now, there's two steps at this point. Notice that emotion and wonder to yourself, what else could I be doing to experience that emotion other than this food? Who could I call that might make me feel more connected and more loved? What could I do that might make me feel more energy, more happy? What could I do other than that food that might give me that feeling? Interesting thought, isn't it? Now, we go back to that feeling. The next observation you want is, what's the feeling you have the minute you decide to eat the food? That's interesting. Because very often pe for people, they have the low energy feeling and they make the decision to eat the food and instantly start to feel better before they eat the food. In other words, it was never the food that was making you better. It was the kind of hypnotic anchored response that the food industry and your upbringing gave you. So suddenly somebody goes, I'm feeling a low, but I think what I'll do is I'll eat a little chocolate. <gasps> I'm going to eat chocolate. I already begin to feel better. Interesting, isn't it? It proves that it's not the food that's making you feel better. Good observation. Then the next step, as you move through the timeline, there's the way I was feeling, there's the way I feel after I decide to eat the food, and then there's what we call first bite. First bite is that moment that you first put that food in your mouth. And the question has to come up. At that point, is it as good as you thought it was going to be? Maybe so, but often not. And then what about second bite, third bite, subsequent bites? And here's where you'll find that humans very often eat automatically after the first few bites. It's an evolutionary design. In the old days, 100,000 years ago, you couldn't sit at the bush and just eat fruit off the bush and bliss out because something would come and eat you. So you had to eat and keep an eye out. And so we're very good at shutting off consciousness and putting food in our face. So I want you to notice that today. And then lastly, I want you to notice how you feel right after, half an hour later, and maybe even an hour or two later. That is your homework for today. To eat the way you're eating before, to allow some things in that maybe you've been resisting, and then observe, observe, observe. How was it yesterday? What did you observe? What did you allow back in? Hmm? 
So this is really interesting stuff. Right now, what I'm hoping that you began to see is how prolific sugar is in all the ingredients of everything. What I'm also hoping you began to notice a little bit is how convoluted the decision to eat sugar is. In other words, you have these emotions, you think that the food's gonna create a certain you know, feeling in you and all this kind of stuff. What I'm hoping is that I've started to make you more mindful of the entire process. I'm also hoping that yesterday you felt good about yourself, that if you did eat sugar because you were supposed to, that it didn't hurt your self-esteem in doing so, that you were following along and you're fully successfully one day into this challenge. So today, are you ready to give some stuff up? Are you ready? Because you knew that was coming, right? We were gonna give some stuff up. So before we talk about which kinds of things to give up, what I wanna know is, which ones are you most nervous of giving up? Mm -hmm. What is it you're most concerned about? Like, are there some things where you're going, yeah, but I just, I don't know about that. I mean, not my day wouldn't be complete without it. Those are very interesting foods. And so are you ready? Here's what we're gonna do. Today, we're going to give up nothing. Again, I want you to keep going. I want you to continue with observation. We're gonna add some things, but we're not gonna subtract a single thing right now. I want you to continue to eat exactly as you're eating before this challenge began, and even to continue to allow things in that you've been using willpower to resist so that you can really pay attention to some important things about your psychology. And what I would like you to do is to increase, if you were already eating some fruit, I'd like you to increase your fruit intake. And if you weren't eating fruit, I want you to eat some. I just wanna give you some rules about it. Fruit is a really fascinating food. It's a food that our bodies really want. It's the one food in nature that truly wants to be eaten. Everything else tries to prevent itself from being eaten. Animals run away, they fight, they defend themselves. Plants develop these incredible biochemical defenses against getting eaten like glutens and caffeines and all these things that are in plants that are designed to stop them from being eaten. But fruit, fruit wants to be eaten. It advertises itself brightly and it says, eat me please, why? Because it wants us to eat it and then transport the seed away from the parent plant. Now, that said, there's something important to know about that. It wants you to eat it, but it doesn't want you to digest the seed. So every fruit has a different way of defending its seed. Like strawberries defend the seeds by having hundreds of little seeds all around the outside. So no matter how much you chew that strawberry, you're never gonna break up all those seeds, right? So that's one way of defending. How about the grape? Now some of you are probably gonna remember what it's like to bite into a grape back in the days when grapes still really had seeds in them, right? Before we like bred them out. But you see, if you remember what it was like, what was the look on your face after you bit into a grape seed? It was awful, right? When you bite into a grape seed, your, your mouth is just filled with this intensely bitter taste. And a memory is created that will make you ever so careful about eating grapes after that, right? The, the, the odds of you biting into another grape seed the next day or even the next week or even the next month are very low. In fact, it seems like the memory lasts for at least a year, right? A season. In other words, it's gonna make sure that any grapes you eat for that year, the seeds are gonna survive the process. How cool is that? So, one more thing has to happen though in order for seeds to survive the process, and that is they can't be digested. That's the problem. You see, it's all fine and good to figure out a way to get past you, the seed, the strawberry with all the seeds on the outside, the grape seed where you don't bite into it, but maybe you still swallow it. Well, now what we have to do is we have to understand that fruit wants to pass through the digestive system as quickly as possible so as not to get destroyed by all your stomach acids. So fruit is kind of like this perfect pre-digested food. It's kind of just ready for the intestines. And so it wants to pass through your stomach really quite quickly. And so with that in mind, this day of the challenge, you're gonna eat lots and lots of fruit, as much as you want, in the morning. In the morning. It's really important that you do it in the morning before you have any other foods. Eat fruit in the morning when your stomach is empty, when there's nothing else in there. When you eat fruit on top of other foods, look, you can probably deal with it, but it might give you some heartburn, it might slow down your digestion, and it may rob you of some of the beautiful vitamins and minerals that are in that fruit that you really need. So, you're gonna increase your intake of fruit today, but on an empty stomach only, on an empty stomach only. And then you're gonna to continue to eat the rest of the day the way you normally would. And as I said, if there's been some you know, sweet foods, some sugar-based foods that you've been avoiding out of willpower, you're not gonna avoid them. You're gonna let them in and feel okay about it. 
Then I want you to remember the observations from yesterday and this time I want you to pay really close attention to your food angel and your food devil. You know what I'm talking, right? You got the food devil over here going, come on, like a little drug dealer, right? Come on, just one, you can have it, you can have it. And the food angel's like, yeah, you know, I don't think we do, we, I really think we should take a little break. Maybe we should go on a bit of a diet. And the food devil's like, no, we should just have it. You had such a hard day at work today, you deserve it. No, I, I know I deserved it, but I deserved it yesterday and we ate it yesterday. And so I think today we should kind of, no, don't, don't do it. Don't, you don't need to, we can do that tomorrow. Have you ever had a conversation like that inside your head? I really today want you to pay attention to that conversation inside your head. I want you to really notice that conversation. Notice how you sell yourself on sugar. I want you to imagine that I'm going to introduce you to my friend, the car salesman, because you're thinking about buying a car. I tell you about him first. I tell you that what's going to happen the minute you walk in is he's going to break into a big cheesy grin. Then he's going to shake your hand and make solid eye contact and squeeze well and really look you in the eye. Then he's going to ask all about your family and he's going to ask all about your favorite vacation. Then he's going to start showing you some cars and after showing you the cars, he's going to find the one that he thinks you're most interested in and he's going to ask you this question. He's not going to ask you if you want to buy the car. He's going to ask you if you would like to buy this car, would you like to pay cash or would you like to have it on a payment plan? Right? Now, let's imagine you show up at the car lot. Done. You get there. You see him. He gives you a big cheesy grin and he squeezes your hand. You're thinking, oh. Eric told me about this is part of his sales strategy. Then he asks about your family, asks about your vacation. I knew he was going to do that. And you inside kind of smirk. You know his strategies. A strategy known is a strategy blown. He's not nearly as effective on you anymore. And then finally, you've been looking at the cars and he says to you, well, he doesn't say, do you want to buy the car? He gives you what's called a double bind. He gives you a close that gives you only one of two yes answers. Would you like to buy the car by paying cash or on a payment plan? Well, there's no no to that. And so you've heard it. You knew it was coming and it's powerless over you. Today, what I want you to do is I want you to notice how the sugar devil, how that little food devil beats up the angel, how it convinces it, how it, how it convinces it and manipulates it into agreeing, okay, it's time to eat sugar. If you can do this, what you can do is interrupt that pattern, increase your awareness and in the future, the devil won't have nearly as much control. Let me be very clear. Willpower does not work for most people. The odd person can make a massive change out of willpower alone. But what we've found helping thousands of people over 20 countries around the world is that willpower is ineffective, which is why most people gain three pounds every time they go on a diet. But if we can help the food devil and food angel come together on something, if we can get to the place where people are making conscious food decisions and not needing to use willpower, we can change the world, which we are already doing and we're gonna do right now for you relative to sugar in such a short period of time. So increase your fruit intake, eat fruit on an empty stomach, watch your food dialogue today, and I'll see you tomorrow. Welcome back, day three of your new relationship with sugar. So let me ask you something. What have you learned the last couple of days? What have you observed? Have you been noticing the ingredients? Have you been noticing how prolific sugar is? Have you been noticing how these foods make you feel? Have you binged a little? It's possible. I mean, I told you, if you've been resisting stuff through willpower, then you gotta let it in. So it's possible you've been having a little more even than normal. How's your body feeling about that? Have you noticed that sometimes after eating something rich in sugars that you have a bit of a crash? Have you noticed that sometimes you think, oh, this is the emotion that's making me want to eat sugar, but if I eat that sweet thing, if I have that chocolate, that cake, that ice cream, whatever the case may be, that I'm going to feel like this, and that maybe you even do feel like that for a moment, but then pretty soon you feel like this over here again, and then it all starts again. Have you noticed some of these things? Sugar is insidious. I kind of have this theory that if in the United States, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, now had to approve sugar, like if it wasn't already kind of grandfathered in, if they now had to approve it as a food, I just don't think it would make it. Except of course for the fact that the sugar lobby has a lot of money, so probably it would. Now, let's talk about the next step in the challenge. It's very important that you keep eating some really good healthy fruits in the morning. Of course, it's always best if you can get some good organic sources of fruit. And remember that you're eating it on an empty stomach and starting your day that way. It's very important that we start our day with a nice healthy amount of fruit during this challenge. 
I want to be very clear. I know some of you have these questions of, I've heard even fruit can be bad. No, fruit is not bad, but many things that are good are bad in excess. And, and I don't mean in excess in a given day, because frankly, there's no amount of fruit you could eat today that's the wrong amount. In fact, the more the better right now. Fruit on a daily basis, every single day, can be a bad idea. And the reason is that your pancreas needs a break from sugar. Nature would have forced breaks like that upon our pancreas, and unfortunately, most people in the Western world today, their pancreas never gets a break from sugar. Now, that's not what this seven-day challenge is about. This seven-day challenge is specifically around refined sugar and all of its like little cohorts. So, what are we gonna do? Continue our fruit intake. Well done. And then today, today's the day. Today we are going to eliminate all refined sugar and artificial sweeteners. All refined sugar and artificial sweeteners. So that means no sugar, no healthy sugar, no raw organic cane sugar, no corn syrup, no sugar, no honey, no molasses, no, you know all the different names? None of it. No sugar. What that means is you're really gonna have to take a look at the ingredients of everything you eat. I'll give you a hint. If you're eating tomato sauce, like you know from pasta, it's gonna have sugar in it most times. There are many brands that don't, but most of them do. If you're going to a restaurant and you're ordering something that's sauce-based, probably has sugar in it. You need to ask the waiter. And by the way, if you're starting to think, whoa, 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 I don't wanna be that person. I don't wanna be that person that's always, oh, I, I can have this but not that, and I don't wanna be fussy. Let me explain something to you. One of the principles of WildFit is that the expression everything in moderation also includes your health. So when people say to you, oh, don't take it so seriously, everything in moderation, well, then that means moderate health. And moderate health means getting sick a couple times a year. It means one in three people in America dying of heart disease. It means one in three people in America dying of cancer. That's everything in moderation. Now, I'm not talking about becoming an extremist. I'm talking about an experiment for a few days. So be willing to be that person because that person is far less likely to develop diabetes, cancer, heart disease. That person is likely gonna have a better quality of life and that person quite probably is going to live longer as well. So be willing to be that person for a couple of days. Fair enough? So what does that mean? It means that all sugar in its various forms, refined sugar, sweeteners, syrups, all of that stuff comes out with the exception of fresh fruit in the morning, even fructose. People say, well, fructose, the fruit sugar, that's okay. Not if it's the ingredient in a food. If you're eating fructose in a piece of whole fruit or in a fruit salad or something like that, raw, not syruped, not canned, raw, and you're having it on your empty stomach, that is your only source of sugar for today. And then you're gonna cut out all the other sugars. In the meantime, you're gonna pay attention to your dialogue at this point because what's gonna happen is we've just taken the kind of like willpower talking stick and handed it over the angel. And so the devil's gonna go, oh, come on, really? Really, no sugar, that's insane, it's everywhere. You deserve it, everything in moderation. And the angel's gonna go, Eric said no. And the devil's gonna go, who the hell is Eric? I don't care about this Eric guy, you go ahead and eat the sugar. And the angel's gonna say, Eric said no. And the devil's gonna go, yeah, but you know, I'm not feeling so good today. You know, I'm feeling a little low. And Eric said no. And then he's gonna, yeah, but you know, we worked so hard and we deserve a reward. You know, we deserve it. And you're gonna notice something about the sugar devil or the food devil. You're gonna notice that the very things that might irritate you about teenagers from time to time, irritate you about them because they're you. In fact, that little sugar devil, that food devil is like a teenager. It's gonna whine and complain and it's gonna come up with all kinds of manipulative reasons and excuses why today should be the day that you don't listen to Eric. Today should be the day that you just go right ahead and have it. No, just for today, have the fruit in the morning and skip sugar for today. Read the ingredients, be diligent. It's one day and I'll see you tomorrow. I wanna share a little story with you because several years ago, I had a conversation with my wife and the conversation was, look, we're really good about our food, we pay attention, we get organic wherever possible, we stick as close as we can to the human diet, we're very, very good about our health. And we make exceptions. And what I found is, is that exceptions can be made based on rules and then rules can get into trouble. Here's, here's a good example. 
You ever notice that sometimes when you go on vacation, you can be a little more flexible about your rules? Well, my wife and I were like that, but we had a problem. And the problem was is that we spend something like nine months of the year traveling all over the world. Like we will often visit as many as 10 or 15 countries in the year and we'll be on the road for often as much as nine months of the year, maybe more. So in a weird way, it was like we were constantly on vacation, which means we were constantly finding a reason to have like an exception. So while we were eating extremely well most of the time in terms of getting a lot of good stuff, we were also allowing a few too many exceptions in terms of getting some of the bad stuff. And so a couple of things happened. She developed an infection on her toe and we were just about ready to go and join Tony Robbins to do a fire walk with Oprah Winfrey. Tony had invited us to come along and we were so excited about going. And then she got this toe infection. The infection was so painful that she couldn't even put on socks, let alone get on a plane, fly from San Francisco to Los Angeles and then do a fire walk, right? And so I started talking with her about this and I said, okay, I have a couple things of advice for you. The one, I recommended her to my Chinese acupuncturist. But the second thing I said to her is, you know, I'm not really a big fan of curing things. I'm a big fan of preventing them in the first place. And I suspect that maybe what's going on here is there's some things that we're eating too regularly and maybe that's what's really happening. And so she says, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know what? I think we need to go off sugar completely. I mean, not be good the way we are. I mean, we need to get rid of it because you know what I've noticed is sometimes when we eat it, it makes us want to eat it again. And then it makes us want to eat it again. And then instead of like having an exception, maybe once a week, we're finding a way to have an exception like a couple times a week or three times a week or every day. And so I said, I think maybe we should, you know, we should give up sugar. Now, I don't know if you've seen any of the Lord of the Rings movies, but there's some beautiful moments in there where Bilbo Baggins has the ring. Maybe you know the story and he has to give the ring to somebody and as he starts to give the ring away, his personality changes. It's like he's, his teeth get longer and it's like, yeah, you know? And, and that's exactly what my wife looked like when I told her we had to give up sugar. I'm not kidding you, it was scary, it was terrifying. And so I have sympathy if you haven't ever tried to give up sugar before with the instructions I gave you yesterday. My question is, how well did you do? Did you rebel against the idea? My guess is probably not, else you wouldn't have taken on this challenge. Right? You wouldn't have taken on this quest. And so I'm hoping yesterday was fun for you. I'm hoping you didn't slip. I'm hoping you stuck with the program. I'm hoping you had your fruit in the morning. I'm hoping that you stayed off all the various forms of sugar there are. And I'm hoping you learned some things about yourself. Did you notice the way the food devil kind of tried to get involved in the whole thing? Did it try to convince you to make an exception? Or did it kind of think, well, it's one day. I'll just stay quiet for today because sometimes that's what happens. So let's give it another day. So again today, lots of fresh fruit first thing in the morning. Absolutely as much as you would like to have as long as you have an empty stomach. Also again remember, very best to get organic fruit if you can. You can have as much as you want on an empty stomach first thing in the morning and no sugars for today and pay really close attention. You see the food devil, he can be very conniving. Sugar is a cunning and baffling substance and the sugar devil is going to be here ready to pounce and try to get you to make an exception. But the problem is he's eavesdropping on our conversation right now. So he's going, all right, I won't try to talk you into it. You want to take a day or two off? I'll let you do that. You're giving me the sugar from the fruit? I'm okay with that. Or you may find that when an emotional upheaval happens, something goes wrong at work, somebody gets in a fight, you get in an argument with your, with your partner, your children, if you've got them, behave the wrong way and suddenly it's like, oh, I just really need a piece of chocolate. That is exactly the moment you wanna to listen to the food devil, pay very close attention to specifically how the food devil tries to convince you that today is the day to make an exception. Consider all the different types of exceptions there are. Oh, it's a rainy day. I should have a treat. Oh, it's so sunny and amazing. We should celebrate. I had such a hard day at work. You did so well today. You got that project done. You won that sale. There are excuses for everything. The more you can be aware of what those excuses are, the less power they'll have over you. So another day of a new relationship with sugar and I will see you tomorrow. Congratulations for being here. Really, I mean that. Lots of people undertake various challenges in their lives and they kind of start them and they don't continue with them and here you are. You're sticking with it. Well done. How are you feeling? What are you noticing? Have you noticed some things about how prolific food is or sugar, I should say, in food is? 
Have you noticed anything about the way your food devil interacts with you? How are you feeling two days off sugar? Hmm. Let me tell you another thing about sugar that's so fascinating. It really is addictive. I mean, it really is. And so, I want you to think about this, that there have been all kinds of tests done where mammals, given the opportunity to have sugar or food, will eat sugar pretty much until they die. And the reason is, is that we have a powerful, powerful craving for it because in nature, it was extremely important to us from a vitamin and mineral perspective. And it was really, really rare. So what that meant was we had to have a powerful craving to go get it. We had to, because think about it. If we have two villages 100,000 years ago, and one village is full of people with a gene that gives them a powerful craving for sugar, and the other one doesn't, and then fruit comes into season. Which village, which group of people is going to eat all the fruit? These guys. They're going to eat it, they're going to go find it. These people may snack on it if they stumble upon it, but these people are going to hunt it down. And when they've eaten a few pieces, have you ever noticed that sometimes sugar makes you want to eat more sugar right away? Not just make you hungry, but make you more, make you want more immediately? Here's why that is. This population, the ones with the craving, they walk up. They eat a couple pieces of sugar. Their stomach feels a little bit full. They start walking away. In the meantime, their pancreas is producing insulin. The insulin comes up and their blood sugar comes down. And at the top of that peak, there's a moment where they experience some insulin shock, which gives them an increased craving for sugar. And so as they walk away from the bush, one turns to the other and he says, hey, you wanna go back and get some more? I think we should get some more. And they go back and eat some more. But their stomach was a little full, right? But that's what's so interesting about the human stomach is that it is expandable. It's expandable. So what that means is they go to the tree and they eat some more and that makes them want more and they go to the tree and they eat some more and pretty soon they're like distended. They've eaten in gluttony because the seasons force that upon them. Here's where it gets really interesting though. When they ate like that, they did a number of things. They took in a whole ton of calories and they communicated to their body that winter is coming because fruit comes right before the winter season. That means drought, it means dryness, it means an absence of hydration and food. These people communicating to their body that winter is coming are going to store fat on their body. That is both water and energy. The other village, they don't do that. So which population survives and passes on their genes? You and I are the descendants of these people. And that's why we have this unbelievably powerful craving for sugar. And that's why we can't really easily resist it when it's around because there's nothing in our DNA that says, oh look, an available source of sugar. We should walk right by. Because that would not have led to survival in the past. Unfortunately, today, it's everywhere. And so that little software inside us, we have this little piece of software inside. It's like, if you see food, eat it. The seafood diet, right? Not seafood. But you know what I'm saying? Now, now there's food everywhere. In anthropological terms, there's a fascinating thing called calories per acre. So you can look at different levels of, you know, sort of, you know, anthropological development or civilization development and measure the available calories per acre that a given civilization might have had. So if you look at, say, a hunter-gatherer bushman like the Hadza, who I've actually gone to live with on a number of occasions, if you look at them, you'll recognize that they have very few calories per acre. Just to survive every day means walking 10 or 15 kilometers a day, every day right? But then you can move up a level. And I say up as if it's better. I just mean a slightly more advanced version of civilization, the Maasai. And they now carry their cattle around with them and their goats. And so they've increased their calories per, per acre dramatically because they're controlling them. And then you can move to agriculturalists. The agriculturalists, that's different because what they're doing what they're doing is actually farming millions or even billions of calories per acre and completely controlling it. Then you move to us or you move to Anaheim, California, and the rest of the world is going in this direction, where there are literally billions of calories per acre, millions of calories all around you all the time that require no effort. Thank you, Uber Eats. I can sit on my couch and order calories without having to do a damn thing. And so, what we have to recognize is that our instincts developed in a time that's very different than today. So, here's your project for today. No more fruit. No more fruit. Fruit has just gone out of season. Now, you may find today, you may find that your energy dips a little bit because you've been relying on this dietary sugar. What I want you to know though, is that in so much as sugar being addictive, as in so much as sugar is addictive, we have the ability to look at different types of sugars at time. 
We often think of sugar as being like heroin, right? And if somebody's addicted to heroin, we need to give them methadone. Methadone is another drug that doesn't give them the high, but allows them to not have the withdrawal symptoms. So over the last two days, we've been using fruit as methadone. We've been taking you off the garbage sugar with healthy sugar. But now, like nature, sugar's gone out of season. And so today is going to be your first day without any sugar. Now, of course, you're having sugars from other sources. You're having sugars from some of your vegetables and maybe you still eat things like bread and grains and that sort of stuff. We can have a much longer conversation about that one day. Right now, what I'm saying is, you're gonna be off refined sugar, all the different names that sugar comes under, and you're gonna eliminate the fruit for today as well. Today's gonna to be your first sugar-free day. And let me give you some warnings about that. One is, as I said, you may find that your energy dips a little bit. It's true. This is the day of diligence. This is the day of freedom. I hate to be so cliched, but today is Independence Day, right? And what that means is, is that when your little food devil, when the little sugar monster comes up and goes, hey, hey, what happened to all my fruit? You gotta have something. I'm feeling really low. I don't care about that Eric guy. I just, we just had that argument with that person and that other person cut us off in traffic and I gotta have a piece of chocolate. I gotta have a cake. Come on, dessert. You've been so good. Look how good you've been. Two days without sugar. You gotta, you gotta give me something. No, 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 no. Today's the day of diligence. Stick with it and let's talk about it again tomorrow. I'll see you then. Day six of your whole new relationship with sugar and let me ask you, how is it going? Really, how did you feel yesterday? I know from experience that some people will have the reaction of low energy and it's a little bit difficult and other people have this like, it really wasn't so tough after all. So my question is, what was it like for you? I really want you to check in and really with a sense of personal honesty, what was it like for you? What did you learn? Did you notice any internal dialogue around, you know, a part of you trying to convince another part of you that you could make an exception? Or was your whole body aligned and saying, no, I'm sticking with this challenge? What I'm hoping actually is that it wasn't easy. What I mean is, is that if you've got really good willpower and you're simply doing this straight through willpower, like the minute the little food devil says, come on, you just go, stop, no, we're doing this for seven days. Then if it's easy for you, what I wanna suggest is, hmm, stop a little, pay attention. Actually, what you really wanna do is you wanna hear what the food devil has to say about this. You wanna hear what that little devil has to say. You might even like pretend you might give in. Yeah, food devil says, come on, make an exception. We were so good for days. We haven't had any sugar at all. You deserve, that's it, a Kit Kat. You should go get one. Then what I want you to do is I want you to just almost like pretend you might give into it. Let the food angel act like it's weak. Now the food angel, we know, we know is not weak. We know that willpower is gonna engage, but I want you to really get a sense of what that dialogue is like. Because you know, I'll tell you something. Again, having helped thousands of people change their entire relationships with food all over the world, here's what I know. Most people are blown away when they recognize how much dialogue they have with themselves about food. And so if you can really stop and pay attention to that dialogue, you can learn so much about yourself. Remember, a strategy known is a strategy blown. The minute you begin to realize the tricks and the tools and the triggering events that that little food devil will use, they lose power. And then I want you to remember something else. It may well be that that low emotion surfaces right now because again, today, no fruit, no sugar. You may notice that that little emotion comes up, whatever it is, maybe it's sadness, loneliness, emptiness, a lack of connection, whatever the case may be, insignificance. It just may be a day of uncertainty of some kind. You may notice that emotion getting amplified because here's what the food devil will do. The food devil will go over and amplify that emotion. It'll start talking to it, it'll be like, Oh, are you feeling a little lonely? Me too. I just, I don't know what it is, but lately I just haven't been feeling very good and I know that ice cream would help. Or maybe, you know, half, half a chocolate bar, not even the whole thing. Or, you know, like a soft drink, just one. Diet, diet even. 
right? What I want you to do is pay really close attention to the way your part of your body or part of your consciousness may attempt to manipulate the other part of your consciousness. What we do in our Wild Fit Challenges is do everything we can to get people to a place very successfully of getting to the place where the food devil and the food angel are actually on the same side. Where literally they walk past foods and they go, nothing. They don't even notice them. They don't even think about them. That's when I realized we could do that for other people, it blew me away. And here's how I found it out. I first did it for me. I used to have a real issue. Like if you put chocolate chip cookies or oatmeal raisin cookies in front of me, it was really difficult. And then of course, years ago, I got into this health stuff. I really paid attention. I said, now I'm done with those things. It still required willpower, but I could resist. Unless of course you told me it was a dairy-free, sugar-free, gluten-free version. And even though it tasted like cardboard, for some reason I'd still want to have it, right? The food devil was in the way. And then doing some of the exercises that we're asking you to do right now, I am at a place right now where it literally has no impact on me. You could put the warm, fresh baked right in front of me and there's no part of me that would even want it ever. Now, I'm not claiming we can achieve all of that here in seven days. What we can do is achieve a basic level of emancipation from sugar. And that's what today is about. So keep paying attention to your internal feelings. Pay attention to your emotions. If you are feeling low, if the, if the food devil is trying to make you feel low or trying to take advantage of you feeling low, then here is the question. Two questions. One, how could I feel better without that food? What could I do to make myself feel better right now? And then the second question is, what emotion do I think the food is going to give me? What, what, what emotion do I think that that particular food is going to give me? And then once you know what that emotion is, you can say, how else could I achieve that? How else could I achieve it? For example, often people feel, you know, isn't it weird that we live in the most connected version of civilization ever and yet there's never been more loneliness? And so very often people are feeling a little disconnected and a little empty and a little... And you know, a piece of chocolate would really go down now, really well now. And I just had my meal and it would finish it off so well to just have a little sweet. Isn't it true that that happens? And so what I want you to do is take a look at what emotion do you think that food is going to give you? Because if you're feeling a little low, a little lonely, maybe what you think it's going to do is give you a feeling of connection, give you a feeling of certainty, or just make you feel a little bit more loved. And so what I will ask you to do today is find other strategies for satisfying that emotion. Really. Isn't it possible that the right phone call to the right person with the right words could flood your body with a little bit of love and connection? Isn't it possible that getting some stuff done at work, getting some stuff done on some project that you've been putting off could give you a feeling of accomplishment, significance? Whatever emotion you think you're satisfying with that food, you're really not. Or if you are, it's very temporary. And so what I'm asking you to do is to come up with a really wholesome way of satisfying that emotion. That's your project for today. Again, no refined sugars, not in any of its different disguises, and no fruit today. Continue your new relationship with sugar, and I will see you tomorrow. I am so proud of you. I really mean this. Look, let's be really clear. People undertake diets or challenges and they say I'm going to try something for some time and the vast majority of people do not get it done and you're here and you're getting it done and I want to know I want you to know something I know that some of the people haven't been able to stick with it a hundred percent and I know very many people have so first of all if you have if you stuck with it hundred percent totally congratulations today is the last day of the challenge and if you've had the odd moment where maybe you did give in to the food devil or something snuck in by accident which happens quite often the big thing is don't take that as a loss don't take that as a hit take it as an opportunity to learn I don't really believe in mistakes or let me put that differently I believe that a mistake is only really a mistake when you do it the second time the first time it was an experiment and so if you accidentally experimented or even a little intentionally that's fine as long as you learned from it as long as you noticed how it really made you feel and now today here we are today one more day with no fruit one more day with no refined sugar under all its disguises one more day and what you need to pay attention today to really lock this in is a couple of things make sure that you pay attention to that internal dialogue Really notice the way the food devil comes in and tries to convince you to, to make an exception, to try just one bite. Oh, just one bite. You know, often that little food devil's a bit like a dog. Have you ever had that? A dog who's been trained badly to sit at the table and beg, and they sit there and they look at you, 
and they look at you. And you know what they're saying? They're just going, come on, just one. One chip. Give me one chip, one chip, one chip, one chip. Please, just one chip, one chip, one chip, just one chip, just one chip, just one chip. And finally, you kind of give in and you go, oh, all right, I'll give you the one chip. And then the dog goes, takes a chip, eats it, done. And then the dog's back. Come on, one chip, one chip, just one chip, right? Well, the food devil's exactly like that. The food devil can sit there and beg and plead. And if you give in to it, you are going to give it strength. That's the joke of it. Now, here's something really important to remember. The challenge is not over until you wake up tomorrow morning. Now, this is important because the food devil's gonna argue with you about this. It's entirely possible that the food devil's gonna go, hey, well done, you did it. I'm really proud of you. We should celebrate tonight with dessert. I mean, you've done it for a full seven days. What's the cutoff? I mean, after we've made it all the way through the seventh day, you know, you're complete. So why don't we, why don't we just have a little celebration? I'm telling you, there's every chance that the food devil's gonna say that to you. There's also every chance that he's not. There's every chance that over the seven, last seven days, if you've really played the mental games properly, if you've really observed carefully, you may find that the food devil doesn't want sugar anymore. And if that's happened for you, fantastic. It's fantastic. And I know it can happen because we've done that kind of work for thousands of people all over the world. So it's absolutely possible that that has happened. But if it is not, again, it's seven days here. If you find that the food devil is jumping in tonight and saying, you know, well done, let's have dessert. Then what I want you to know is this is your great opportunity. This is the opportunity to really slay the food devil or more to the point, get the food devil to realize a fundamental truth. The food devil lives inside your body too. And when you get sick, and when you have problems with your health, the food devil has to experience them. By the way, have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed, for example, I don't know, maybe not you, but somebody in your life has had a little too much to drink one night, and they drank, and they drank, and they drank, and then the next day they're vomiting. You offer them a drink while they're vomiting, they would never have it. You can offer them a drink the day after they vomited. No, because the memory is really fresh, right? The memory is really fresh. In that moment, the sugar devil, the food devil is on board, right? When we're sick, the food devil's like, no, don't eat garbage, just don't do it. But when you're healthy, the food devil's like, bring it on, man, let's do it. And what you can do and what I want you to do and what tonight might just be the opportunity for you to do is to bring that food devil on board at least as far as it is with sugar right now. So if that food devil starts trying to talk to you about, you've done so well, Congratulations on completing the challenge. Let's go have dessert. Hey, can we have a Coke? Come on, just one Coke, one Coke, one Coke, one Coke, one Coke. Not, how about Pepsi, 7-Up, something. Could we have, we, we, how about just some honey? Come on, honey's healthy. People have been eating honey for millions of years. Let's have some honey. If any of that stuff happens, this is your moment to observe every single sales technique, every single manipulation that that food devil uses on you and simply turn it down. And you just might find that by doing that, you completely change your relationship both with your food devil and with sugar in general. And to do it really properly, I have to point it out, you need to wake up tomorrow morning having completed the challenge. You wake up tomorrow morning before you even entertain the idea of reintroducing fruit or sugar. You may find also that by doing that, hey, you don't even feel like having it. Or if you do feel like having it, the entire experience is diminished. You have more control over the dialogue. You have more freedom where it relates to sugar. Keep paying attention to the food labels. And in fact, I wanna offer you one bonus. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, even though the challenge is over, I wanna offer you the opportunity to have one more session with me. And in that session, we're gonna talk very clearly about the tricks that the food industry is using to get us to eat far more food that we need. Let's be very clear. Over the course of human history, humans, have most commonly died of starvation. And in a really weird twist of fate, we still are. In fact, most people in the Western world are overfed and still dying of malnutrition. And so we're gonna to talk tomorrow about some really powerful distinctions that we've gained over the last 20 years, living with Bushmen in Africa, studying archeology, span anthropology, and of course, helping thousands of people all around the world permanently change their relationship with food. And I'll share with you some really powerful strategies that you can use to do the same thing.
Congratulations on completing this seven day mini quest. Well done. How does it feel? How do you feel about your relationship with sugar? Do you have a little bit of increased power over the food devil? Do you have a little bit more freedom, a little bit more consciousness? I hope so. And now what I want to do is I want to share with you why I am so passionate about this because it's been a journey and it's been a journey that has resulted in a massive health turnaround for me and many, many thousands of people. And so here's where it begins. I am fundamentally a serial entrepreneur. I've owned a variety of companies ranging from mobile computing, wireless networking, uh, Hollywood special effects where I got to do special effects work on movies like Avatar, Pirates of the Caribbean, Transformers and so on. And I started a really cool medical simulation company that developed high fidelity medical simulation trauma trainers for the US Army. So mostly I've been an entrepreneur. Underneath it all, my biggest passion for the last 20 years has been about human health. It begins with me as a 20 year old kid recognizing that I'm sick. And I don't mean sick in the way of like, you know, a huge childhood disease or something debilitating or terminal. I just mean that I was that kid that could never breathe through my nose, that always had really tragic acne, that had digestive cramps and problems on a regular basis and headaches and, and throat infections that made it difficult for me to swallow. That was just my life. I had allergies, horrible allergies to cats and dust. I just lived that way. I was weak. And I didn't know, I didn't think of it as sick. I just thought of it as me because I didn't really have any other experience. That didn't stop people from sending me to go see doctors and, and, and get you know, injections and pills and, and even prescribed surgery to fix things. And, 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 and the medical industry could do nothing for me. I mean, I'm telling you, after 10 years of injections and pills and all this kind of stuff, every symptom I had was just like it was before. And then all of a sudden, I was inspired to take a different look at food, to take a different look at food and the role it played in my health and in my life. And for 30 days, I made some changes, just some basic common sense changes. And 30 days later, I'd lost 35 pounds and all of my symptoms had gone away, all of them. The terrible stomach cramps and digestive problems, gone. Headaches, gone. Cystic acne, gone. I mean, I was amazed. I was completely shocked. I couldn't believe the change in my life and in my body. It was phenomenal. I mean, I'm telling you, if I were to go back and tell the 18 year old me that by the time I got to my 40s, I will have visited over 50 countries around the world, that I will have started, sold and bought companies in a wide variety of industries like mobile, cap mobile data capture, wireless networking, field service and repair, events management, Hollywood special effects, uh, camera engineering, 3D camera engineering, medical simulation for the US Army. I wouldn't have believed that stuff. I wouldn't have believed that I would get to do, uh, that I would get to own a company that was providing special effects to movies like Pirates of the Caribbean and Transformers and Iron Man. I wouldn't have expected all those things. I also wouldn't have expected to have the phenomenal level of health and energy that I have right now because that was not my reality back then. My, I used to, I still do love cats. I really love cats, but if I got near them, it would just stuff me right up and sneezing and wheezing. Now, I can cuddle cats, I can cuddle dusty cats and I have no problem. My allergies are gone. I have a tremendous amount of health and vitality and I live a really full life. I travel more than half of the year speaking for thousands of people in probably 10 or 15 countries every single year. I come home and if I wanna go, I kiteboard and I'm, I'm out on the water kiteboarding for three or four hours. When I'm on stage, some of our workshops, I can be on stage for 10 or 12 hours a day for five days in a row, having just arrived from eight time zones away. I have an abundance of energy that was completely different than my earlier experience of life. And let me be very clear, had I not tapped into this form of health, vitality and energy, I would not have been able to achieve all of those things because those things required power and power comes from health. Listen, I gotta tell you, a huge amount of the time when people procrastinate and put things off, a huge amount of time it's because they just run out of energy. They don't feel it that way, they don't see it that way, but that's partly what's going on. And so, I got real curious at that point why it was that I could spend 10 years visiting doctors and turn none of this around. I mean, you have to think, right? I mean, 10 years, pills, needles, they, they even wanted to cut my tonsils out of my throat. I did not let them in the end, but I'm telling you, nothing created any benefit from them whatsoever. I mean, if I'm really fair, every so often they'd give me a treatment that would deal with a symptom in the short term. I remember, for example, they gave me these like cortisone nasal ingestions, so you just inhale it up into your sinuses. And yes, for a day after that, I could breathe through my nose. But what would I need again the next day? more nasal congestion, which by the way, if you're a pharmaceutical company is a awesome marketing plan. 
The thing is, I started getting really curious about the medical industry and the pharmaceutical industry and of course the food industry. And here's a couple things that I found. One, I asked a friend of mine, actually a relative, who was a surgeon, who'd spent something like 10 years in medical school. And I said to him, hey listen, can you tell me, in all your 10 years of medical school, how much time did you spend studying food and nutrition? And he cocked his head to one side and he said, you know, that's a really good question. I don't recall any. Think on that for a minute. And by the way, I have now asked that question of doctors all over the world. Just a few weeks ago, I was in Munich, I was in Germany, speaking about WildFit in front of a thousand people. And I started telling this story and I said, just whimsically, I said, by the way, are there any doctors in the house? Because one thing I want to be really clear about, this is not a judgment of doctors at all. I think for somebody to make the commitment to go to medical school and work those kind of hours in their internship, that speaks of somebody who wants to heal. That speaks of somebody who has a giving heart and a caring heart. So please don't take this as any indictment of doctors. So I asked, are there any doctors in the house? So I could say this. So I could say, hey, listen, I'm not judging you. And then there was a doctor sitting here in the third row. And I said that to him. I said, listen, I want you to know this is not a judgment of you, it's a judgment of the way the education is being done right now. And here's my question for you. How long did you go to medical school? And he said, well, six years. He was a general practitioner. And I said, okay, and in your six years of medical school, how much time was devoted to studying food and nutrition? And he said, microphone in hand, in front of a thousand people, cameras rolling, none. Now, I didn't know for sure what the answer was because I'd never asked that question in Germany before, but disconcertingly, again, it was none. Think about that. And now, think about the food industry because they're the ones that are studying food. They're the ones that are paying attention to it. But what are they curious about? I mean, do they care how healthy we are? I don't think so. What they care about is profitability. And look, I'm a capitalist all day long. I value capitalism. It's not perfect, but it's the best system we have right now. It's the best of a bunch of bad systems, right? Here's the thing. Food manufacturers are in it for the profit. And once people have eaten enough food, there's no way to make any more profit. I mean, sure, you can compete with other food manufacturers and try to get the people to eat your food instead of their food, but that becomes a price war. That becomes margin erosion. What if instead, what if instead you could just simply get people to eat more? Hmm, that could be very profitable. I mean, if you could get people to eat three times as much food as they need, you could make three times as much profit. So how could we do that? Well, one thing we could realize is once we've got their attention, once we've got them eating, to get them to eat a little more, there was no marketing cost in it, so what we could do is sell them more food at a lower price, but we'd still make more money. <gasps> we could supersize the food. Well, we could also supersize the people by the looks of things. Wait a minute, what else could we do? Hey, I know, what if we were to reduce the nutritional load of the food? Like, what if we were to empty the nutrients? What if we were to produce a bunch of foods that frankly had no nutritional benefit at all? Then people would eat and still feel hungry. That would be genius for profitability. Oh, I know another one. What if we could find like chemical compounds? You know, what if we could find things that we could put in the food that would stimulate their appetite? That would be genius, right? If we could put something in the food that would make them hungry, wouldn't that be great? Refined sugar, as we've been talking about. Wait, what if we could find chemicals that would not only make them hungry, but how about this? What if we could find chemicals that would make them feel wonderful, but then make them feel terrible if they don't eat our product? I mean, that would be genius. Hello, caffeine industry. See, the entire food industry has been predicated upon the concept of get them to eat more, get them to consume more. And I want you to remember, if I sound a little conspiracy theorist-like, remember what we talked about in the seven-day challenge. The sugar industry hired Harvard researchers to change the truth. Right in the midst of the time when all the studies were indicating that sugar was related to heart disease, they paid Harvard researchers to say something else, that it was fat that was causing the problem. So if I sound a little extremist, it's because maybe it's time that we are. All over the world, in the Western world, we are facing a major health crisis. What I mean by that is, is that there are waiting lists at the hospitals. People can't get time to go in to, get their, to go see their doctor. They needed a special surgery. They have to wait longer than they can. And the cost on the public purse is phenomenal. You know, when somebody dies of heart disease, there's something kind of merciful in that because quite often it's a quick and merciful death, both for them and for the economical load or the economic load on the healthcare industry. But often when people die of cancer, which is one in three people, they can take years, years to go, which is extremely hard on them, unbelievably hard on their families. And it can cost the public purse or the private healthcare or themselves, depending on how it's, get paid, how it's getting paid for. 
hundreds of thousands of dollars. We have a major healthcare crisis happening on earth today and we need to make a change. The challenge is that we need to compete against the millions and millions of dollars of advertising and hypnosis and manipulation that the food industry is giving to us so that we can start making our own food decisions. Look, you already know that you need to eat more vegetables, a greater variety, better quality. You probably already get that you need to have lots of water. You probably know that you should be eating less chemicals and additives and all that kind of stuff. You kind of know all this stuff, right? But yet for some reason, it's so easy to make exceptions. Sure, we can use willpower to lock it down. We can, on January 1st, we can say everything's gonna be different, but how long does that last? For most people, minutes. For some people, hours. For others, days. Some people even manage to get it out to weeks. A few people get it to go for months. And very rarely, the odd person manages to make lasting life change with willpower. But that is not the path for most people, which is why statistically the average person that goes on a diet gains three pounds every time they do it. Every diet out there is basically built upon a principle of boomerang. We're gonna do something extreme to you to create an immediate result and that it's gonna be so extreme that it's gonna cause you to boomerang right back and regain your weight and cause all kinds of issues. What we need to do is work with people to massively improve their nutrition and change their psychology. And at WildFit, that's exactly what we've done. And that is a combination of two things. The first category is nutritional anthropology. You know, there's a fundamental mistake about the way we use the word diet. We talk about the word diet like it means temporary alteration to your eating pattern in order to fit into some outfit for a special occasion. Whereas for every other species on earth, diet means lifestyle. And so when we study nutritional anthropology, what we get is that we, homo sapiens, have specific nutritional requirements and specific food processing capacities. I can tell you all day long about how this here wooden table is full of vitamins and minerals that are just so valuable. But the fact is, if you're not a beaver with a beaver's teeth and a beaver's digestive system, you can't extract those nutrients. Unless maybe you're a termite, but as you're a homo sapien, you can't eat all those valuable vitamins and minerals and fiber that comes in that wood. You need to get those vitamins and minerals from things that your body is capable of digesting. So nutritional anthropology is a very fascinating science. And the second category is behavioral change psychology. Why? Because frankly, these days, as much as people are confused about food, and they are, and it's by design, the food industry wants people to be confused because it creates cognitive dissonance. Once you're confused, you basically just eat what you want. But to the degree that people are not confused, they know to eat more of that and less of that, but they're not doing it or they do it for short periods of time. They can't stick with it. And so until we really begin to unlock some of these key fundamental ideas of behavioral change psychology, we couldn't create lasting change for people. And then what we did was we married these two things together. We married nutritional anthropology, solid nutritional information with really powerful technologies for change and we created programs that help people completely change their relationships with food. And, and what's fascinating is, even though our programs are not weight loss programs, and I really wanna be clear they're not, we have peak performance athletes, we have people who wanna lose weight, and everybody in the middle. While our programs are not designed for weight loss, they may just be the most effective weight loss programs on earth as it stands right now, because we're running at something like a 90% success rate with our clients. Why? Because weight loss is a side effect of healthy living. When somebody is eating properly and following some basic principles around seasonality and eating the right foods, their body says, I don't want to carry this extra weight around. Why? It's wasting energy. I have to send oxygen. I got to pump blood there. I got to run my lymphatic system around. I got to carry it around on my legs. And so the body actually wants to let it go. And so once you return the body into health balance, it actually quite happily releases it and lets it go. Over the last 20 years, I've gone to live with Bushmen in Africa. I've studied archeology span and anthropology. I've then spent a huge amount of time studying things like neuro-linguistic programming and behavioral change psychology to figure out what it is that does create lasting change for people. And as a consequence of that, I am super proud. One of my, of all the great business accomplishments I've had, of all the great adventures I've undertaken, nothing fills me with more pride than the fact that on a daily basis, I get emails from people and Facebook posts and Instagram posts that tell me things like, 
My doctor just took me off my blood pressure medication. I am no longer type 2 diabetic. My, my fibromyalgia symptoms have gone away. My inflammation is gone. The arthritis I used to have in my fingers is gone. I have significantly more energy. I've lost 10, 20, 30 pounds or more. I get messages like that every single day. The ones that I like even more than that are the ones that go like this. I made all these changes in my life and now my family's doing it too. I had one just a few days ago where a woman wrote and she said, my life has been changed because my seven-year-old girl went out to a restaurant with me and in the restaurant she ordered her meal and decided not to have the french fries that came with it. She asked them not to bring them. She ordered a salad instead. She's seven. She used to push away anything green, but then she ordered the salad and then she ate it. And then when it came time to order a drink, she ordered a water. Amazing. And this woman wrote to me and she said, I don't know how this happened. And I explained it back to her in response. I said, because the primary learning mechanism of homo sapiens is observation. Right now, I have a four month old baby at home. And it's so neat because right around the fourth into the fifth month, babies start really watching the adults around them. Your children, should you have them, if you have them now or if you plan to have them, they watch you. And so some of my absolute favorite emails are from the people who say, hey, I didn't push my family, they followed. I didn't push my coworkers, they followed. We are at the beginning of an unbelievably badly needed food revolution. And what I'd like to ask you to do is join us. I want to challenge you to spend 90 days with me. If you found that over the last seven days, if you found that your relationship with sugar was changed just even a little bit over that seven days, if you found that you became more aware of your dialogue and the way your body felt about these things, if you found that whole exercise of looking at your emotions powerful, imagine what we can do with three full months. Join me for 90 days, undertake our wild fit challenge and life will never be the same again. I guarantee it. It will be so much fun. It will change everything for you. Transform your relationship with food. Gain true freedom. Get your health back. And I hope one day we get to meet in person and you can tell me exactly how it went. Begin an entirely new relationship with food, with your body, and of course, with the food marketing industry. So I'll see you after you sign up. Let's spend three months together.